Good morning. If you would, turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 23. As you're turning there, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to those who uh, came over and supported the work over at the DeGaulle Drive uh, congregation. I had the opportunity to speak there on Friday night, and several of the members here from Hickory Knoll came out and I'm sure supported me, but also on the bigger picture, supporting the work at one of our area congregations uh, here in the greater New Orleans area. Well, for the last couple of weeks, 109 Allison Drive has been a hub for Fall Fest stuff. And I don't know all the things that Mitzi and some of the kids have been working on, but uh, I was very thankful yesterday to finally be able to help in transporting all the stuff uh, over here from our house over here to the church building. And there is a lot of wonderful things that are going to be happening uh, tonight at Fall Fest. Yes, it is tonight. It begins at 6.30. If you haven't got a flyer yet, there's still plenty of back there. And maybe you can look at it to remind yourself to come and to bring your children and your grandchildren and your nieces and your nephews and anyone else that you can find that would be willing to come. We are going to be having all kinds of good stuff. The kids can wear a costume if, if they want and they can bring a friend uh, we're going to have some indoor games, some crafts, some prizes, and some trunk or treating, of course. And one of the things, and by the way, plenty of food as well, chili and nachos and, and all the fixings to go along with it. And we are also going to be having a pumpkin decorating contest. Now, I don't know anything about decorating pumpkins. I don't know much about them, but the sermon title this morning is a pumpkin-like faith. And I have a pumpkin over here this morning. And those of you on the front on this section may not be able to see it, but this pumpkin is just like any normal pumpkin, but uh, as you can see, it's not absolutely perfect. It kind of leans one way. It, it's kind of not necessarily ag- proportional. And as you can see with this pumpkin, like many, when you pick them out of a pumpkin patch, it's a little bit dirty on the outside. And so the first thing you want to do generally is to wipe this thing off. Get this dirt off of here. Just bear with me for a second here. We want to make this pumpkin look as good as we possibly can on the outside. All right. I'll have to do some cleaning up later. So here's our pumpkin. Yeah, it is a big pumpkin, and and it's looking good on the outside. We haven't done much, but what we've simply done is we've taken a moment or two to just wipe it off on the outside, to get that dirt off, and at least from the external or from the outside, it looks pretty clean, at least cleaner than what it was a couple of moments ago. But as you know, there to pumpkins, there's more to it than the outside, and there's the inside of these pumpkins and I've already carved the top and you can see look at some of that disgusting junk that is in here and so what we want to do is we want to be able to get this stuff out of here so we're just going to get some of this I don't even know what they call that stuff but it's disgusting All right, that's some, and we're going to get some from over here, too. There, this stuff is, this thing is filled with disgusting stuff on the inside. So I'm going to just go ahead and get a big old scoop of this and try to throw it away. All right, one more good scoop of this stuff. All right, now, our pumpkin looks good on the outside, and it's a lot cleaner on the inside as well. Now, we're not going to do any cooking today, but that was just a little uh, way of getting us to understand. And you've already figured out by now that our faith, our life, is similar to pumpkins. And what we see about pumpkins, it reminds us of some very important items pertaining to what is truly important in 
our lives. As we think about our lives and as we're thinking, we have pumpkins in mind. We're going to discuss, first of all, this morning about the importance or how important it is to clean up on the outside and the inside. We want to, as Christians, we want to look good on the outside, but we want to look even better on the inside. Notice with me, if you would, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. Jesus is speaking to a group of people known as the Pharisees. This was a group of people that were very religious. They were very intelligent, but many times very hypocritical because they looked one way on the outside, but on the inside they were totally different. Let's begin in verse number 23 of Matthew 23. And this is Jesus speaking to us today through the word. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mints and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. For you cleanse the outside of a cup and dish... But inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be well or clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against all all of these things, against yourselves, that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Now, obviously, this is much more important, much more significant than any kind of junk that we find inside of a physical pumpkin. We're talking about our lives. We're we're talking about our existence. And, And Jesus uses some graphics here that helps us to understand that it's it's one thing to look a certain way outwardly, but it's a total different thing to be able to have your internal, your insides, your heart reflecting what's going on in the outside. He's talking about some things such as extortion and self-indulgence and the idea of how we are uh, sometimes full of hypocrisy and lawlessness in that, yes, we might be looking religious on the outside. We might have dressed up very nice on, on Sunday morning. We might look like we say the right things to others, but it is possible to look and appear to others one way, but on the inside be completely different. Jesus talks about these weightier matters of the law. Verse 23 of our text, these weightier matters, it's not to say what we do on the outside, our actions and how we present ourselves. It's not to say that those things are unimportant. But what is what Jesus is saying is that if we are simply living by our outward appearances and neglect these weightier things, then we have missed the big idea. 
We need to start from the inside and take care of these weightier matters of law. Specifically, Jesus mentions justice and mercy and faith. Justice, mercy, and faith. It's possible to appear to be a Christian, but if in our hearts we are not living a life in which we are striving to do the right thing, that we are easing up on others when they do wrong and they deserve some type of retaliation, rather we show them mercy and ultimately living a life of faith. I'm hoping that all of us here this morning, as good as we look on the outside, are even looking better on the inside as our our hearts are filled with justice, our hearts are filled with mercy, and our hearts are filled with faith. We're going to come back to the New Testament in just a moment, but turn over with me, if you will, to your Old Testament in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. Samuel is one of those guys in the Old Testament that was helped quite a bit in the transition of things, in the transition of leadership. And and him serving as a role of transition guy was able to help out with some of the judges and then with Saul becoming the first king of Israel. And we know that didn't work out that well. And so Samuel is called upon again to anoint or to help anoint David as the next king of Israel. Saul is still king, but the word has been out and God has approved that David will be the next king. But let's pick up right there in verse number one of 1 Samuel 16, as Samuel is in the process of getting David set up to become the next king of Israel. Then the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's Lord's anointed is before him. And notice verse 7 of 1 Samuel 16. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord does not see man as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. It's one thing to look at that pumpkin and see that we've wiped it off on the outside, got that dirt off from the pumpkin patch, well, actually Walmart, but we've wiped that off on the outside, and it looks pretty good. But in the same way that we tend to look at things from the outside, we tend to look at people from the outside as well and make judgments on them or, or make a decision about them or, or try to figure out if we're going to associate with them based upon their image in society or, or how well or how popular they are among others. But we're reminded here 
in 1 Samuel that the Lord is not concerned with what's going on in our appearance. He wants our hearts. And when our hearts are in the right place, the outward things are going to take care of themselves. But he wants us to, he wants us to know that it's justice, mercy, and faith. It's a life of living for God authentically, not like hypocrites, but having our inside match our outside. I'm loving the text here in 1 Samuel 16 because as this distinction is being made between outward appearance and the heart, we see what was leading up to it. And we see that Samuel and the others, before they could actually sacrifice, they had to be sanctified. Sacrifice being that outward expression of worship. But in order to outwardly express your worship in front of others, it begins with the process known as being sanctified, being made holy, being separate. And as Christians, that, are, that is what we are striving to do, to have our inward man being sanctified, being renewed every single day. Some of our loved ones recently, and even some of you in, the, in our membership here, have had uh, heart problems in the recent past. And, and we know what heart problems can do. It, it can disrupt our entire physical well-being because if our heart stops, then our life or our physical existence stops as well. And so there's all kinds of things that can be done to the physical heart. You can uh, take some medicine to help some things out, or there may be even some stents or uh, with these procedures that uh, maybe an angiogram or some type of uh, open heart surgery as well to help address the problems associated with the physical heart. But you and I have a much bigger issue to deal with. And it's, yes, we want to take care of ourselves physically, but we do not want to ever experience a spiritual heart attack, a spiritual problem in which we become bitter and angry. Our hearts become calloused and we start rejecting those things that are true, start turning our hearts and our turning our lives away from God and start living a life that is far from the truth which is far from God. So what happens when we realize that we do have a spiritual heart problem? We've come to an understanding that I need to make sure my inside is matching my outside. And I, and I realize, okay, you know, I have a lot of work to do. I have some cleaning up to do. How do we make sure we take care of our hearts spiritually? Well, point number two this morning, we need to let Jesus clean out the mess in our lives. That junk or that gooey stuff or all of that nasty, disgusting things that we allow to come into our heart. We need to let Jesus clean us out. Turn back with me, if you will, to the book of 1 John in your New Testament. First John chapter one, let's begin in verse number five as we're talking and seeing how Jesus, how Christ is connected with the cleansing of our hearts. First John chapter one, verse five. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How do we get rid of that interior problem, that junk that is in our lives? Well, first of all, before we can do anything, we have to realize we cannot do it 
by ourselves, that we need some assistance, we need some help. You see, our spiritual problem is so much, our problem of sin is so drastic that the Bible says in other places that it is sin that separates us from God. And that there is none righteous, no, not one, and that there needs to be something that happens with our problem of sin. And of course, it is Jesus Christ who cleanses us from all sins. He died on the cross. He was buried. He was resurrected. And Jesus has a part in making our insides become spiritually clean. But we have to allow him to begin that process. We have to say yes to God and to allow Jesus Christ to come into our lives as we respond in faith and obedience. How do you become a Christian? How do you begin this process of having your insides cleaned out, having to start all over again? Well, in Acts chapter 22, verse number 16, Saul was told, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Not a physical washing with a rag dipped in water that uh, is going on as we cleaned the pumpkin a moment ago. But a spiritual washing in which our sins are forgiven as we are baptized into Christ. We're calling on the name of the Lord and our sins are washed away. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse number 21. That baptism does now also save us. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not a physical washing, but it's an answer of a good conscience towards God. How do we clean out our hearts? How do we renew our lives? Well, we have to begin by becoming a Christian and allowing our sins to be washed away. And when our sins are washed away... We can walk in the light. And the scripture in 1 John teaches us that Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us from those sins as we are following after him, as we are living every single day of our lives. We close this morning in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 14. Yes, we want to clean up on the outside and the inside. And the way that we do that is we allow Jesus to come in and to clean out the mess that we have in our hearts. And then once our mess is cleaned out, once we are Christians, once we are walking in the light, having our sins washed away, having been cleansed by Christ on a continual basis, what do we do then? Well, we very simply let our lights Shine. Matthew 5, verse 14, Jesus says it this way You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, don't worry, we're not lighting any candles this morning and putting them in that pumpkin. But what we know, and we've seen this several times over, is that when the pumpkin has been carved and the stuff has been cleaned out and it's ready to go, the light can be put in there and that light will shine and it will bring light to other people. Places And that's exactly what happens in our lives as Christians. Just like the little children sing at Pew Packers and VBS, this little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to hide it under a bushel and we're not going to let Satan blow it out because we are going to let our lights shine. 
on our last trip up to Montgomery, we were able to, to stop by on Faulkner's campus, and I was walking around with Will Freeman, and we were going around, and we came to the admissions department, and, and we bumped into this guy named Neil, who has in the past come and visited with us and has told us about uh, Faulkner and the, the Christian education uh, that it provides. And Neil looks at me, and he says, well, so what about that new book? And I replied by saying, well, what about that new Cornerstone CD? And so we made an even swap there. And on the way home, and just about every time our family gets in the car, we listen to Cornerstone. And there's a new song that's on this latest CD. And it's entitled, From the Inside Out. It begins by saying, a thousand times I've failed. Still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. Your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself and bringing you praise everlasting your light shine what all else fails never ending your glory goes beyond all fame in my heart in my soul i give you control consume me from the inside out let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all frame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out. Are you able to cry out to the Lord from the inside out, from the very beginning of your existence, or in the sense of as interior as you can be? Yes, we look good on the outside, but are you praising God? Are you living your life from the inside out? And to have that heart filled with grace, to have that heart filled with justice and mercy and faith, to have your heart sanctified, knowing you have been washed away, knowing you have been cleansed by Jesus Christ. If you are not living your life from the inside out in this morning, and you would like to make a change and to start living this way, in which others can see your Christian light, in which others will know that you are a Christian in your entire existence, on your outward appearance, and on your inside heart. If you need to come this morning, then why don't you do so while we stand and while we sing together?